Good evening, or good, eve good afternoon, everyone, or late afternoon. I want to, before I begin my formal introduction of the, our two speakers, um, pay enormous tribute to the staff of the uh, COGUT who have worked to make this possible, Chore and Kit in particular. Um, the two speakers would have met them on the email as they badgered them um, for various things when I didn't feel like badgering since if I had written, to, since I had badgered enough, <laughs> right? I then asked them to do the badgering. So I want to thank both of them um, for um, all the work um, that they have put in and other members of the staff who are here. I want to welcome all of you to this special occasion. This is the second lecture in the series titled Towards a Critical Global Humanities. And I want to say a few words about this project that's been called the Critical Global Humanities. The project was essentially <coughs> formulated last year out of a set of discussions between Africana Studies, the COGOT, and the Pembroke, and then was consolidated with the, uh, the if you wish, formation of a convening, three convening uh, faculty members, Professor Dr. Um, Vasuki Nish, um, Professor Jiri Augusto, and myself. Our highlight activity was last year was the hosting of a institute of two weeks called Towards a Global Humanities, Critical Traditions from the Global South. And in working through the project, we developed this particular objective last year, and that the critical global humanities was really about uh, one of its uh, aspects or dimension was really about how to explore the concerns of human populations that have histories of exclusion and marginalization from the production and the practices of dominant knowledges, end of quote. We have developed from this position in a series of discussions, both amongst ourselves and other faculty members. And this year, the Global Humanities Institute will in fact be a much broader one than the critical traditions from the South. And the actual theme for this for next June is contemporary theory, performance, and the critical global humanities, having uh, the following subsections, thinking about the political, creative entanglements, humanities and the sciences. Some of you may like this next one. The global crisis and the discipline of economics, religion on alternative modernities, performance as knowledge, and the final sub-theme that we will work on is rethinking theory. How do we understand critical global humanities? That's the project in a nutshell, and hopefully we will have a series of, we have, we have a series of speakers that will end in April next year. Then we will do, go to the Humanities Institute in June and next, fall, next uh, spring as well, we hope to have a series of faculty, internal faculty conversations around this idea of the critical global humanities. So I want to again welcome you to this particular uh, lecture. Today we have two very special guests, Professor Horton Spillers and Professor Ronald Judy. The theme which we have chosen for the entire series for the year is critical thought and the humanities today. We have chosen it because the work of the humanities at its very best is about to the creation and the deployment, if you wish, of critical thought. By which I mean, in the words of Sylvia Winter, critical thought, and here I quote Sylvia, critical thought as a deciphering practice which provides a platform for the assemblage of the reconstitution of knowledge, end of quote. This afternoon, we have two remarkable individuals to stimulate us along these lines. So let me introduce each separately. Professor Horton Spillers is the Conway Vanderbilt Professor in the English Department at Vanderbilt University. 
She has written numerous essays and path-breaking books. She is, in my view, an extraordinary practitioner of the form of writing which we call the essay, in which she writes the ess or writing as essays is about a certain kind of practice of destabilization and questioning of the normal. In my view, her work comes from a rich African-American intellectual tradition that begins with the rhetorical form of the black sermon, then draws from contemporary psychoanalytical theory. But that is a simple description. What is the animating force of Professor Spiller's work? It is, as I understand it, to comprehend and to grapple with the everyday. She says in a interview, recent interview, and here I quote her, the subject lives as theorist, consumer, grows a shopper, and only Hortons could say this, then got to pick up the mail now, then let's get to the bank. Not sure we can get to the bank these days, but that, that time, yes, I understand. The question for me, as Spillers, as, and this is Spiller speaking, is how do you talk about or think about these different beats or rhythms through which you live your life. There is a doing, and then there is a contemplating of the doing. Professor Spiller's gift, if you wish, is her search for a language to describe these practices and their contemplation. Today, she will speak about airing dirty laundry, African-American critique, and NATO community. Our second speaker is Professor Ronald Judy, Professor of Critical Theory <coughs> sorry, and Cultural Studies, the Department of English, University of Pittsburgh. Professor Judy's work has marked him, in my view, as one of the most innovative thinkers around three subjects. The first can perhaps be described as his exemplary work around the work of W.E.B. Du Bois. And here, Professor Judy's work is not just around the novels, but rather around Du Bois's little-known essay, Sociological Hesitance, in which his careful analysis opens new ways, if you wish, for us to think about the questions of the humanities and disciplines. The second of the third questions, which I think animates Professor Judy, is his profound work on the Islamic literary and philosophical traditions, from which I myself have continued to learn a great deal in my engagements with him. And the third is his current work on the history of the imagination. But the way in which he thinks about the imagination, thinking about the imagination as a form of a knowledge practice, practice which disrupts power. For Professor Judy, there are possibilities of alternative human life on this planet. But his concern is, how can we discern them? And what is the relationship of these practices to our conventional understanding of issues like sovereignty? Today, he will speak on the topic from Negro to African and back in, on the way to radical humanism. In describing Professor Judith's project, we perhaps might be, it might be perhaps be important to let him speak for himself. And this is what he says in a recent article on France Fanon, or on, not a recent, but an article on France Fanon. He says, and I quote him, if we accept along with Edward Said, that what is reducible and essential to the human experience is the subjective, and that this experience is also historical, then we are certainly brought to a vexing problem of thought. How to give an account of the relationship between the subjective and the historical? And I think that is what one of the most animating things that actually is the core of his uh, work. Each of these speakers will speak for about 30 minutes, and then the floor will be open, and not after each, but after each have spoken, so one hour of speaking, will be open for full discussion for a hour. And then there's a reception after the event is over. So I'm very, very honored to introduce these two speakers and to bring them to Brown as part of the Critical Global Humanities Project. And I would like you to help me to welcome both to Brown, Professor Judy and Professor Spillers. I'm not going to obviously introduce them again, so Professor Spillers will speak first for 30 minutes and then followed by Professor Judy. <laughs> 
Hortense. I want to thank uh, my colleague and good friend, Professor Bogues, for that wonderful introduction. You know, the thing about introductions is that you don't want them to stop. You kind of wish they could go on and on and that they could take up your 30 minutes. It's really nice to be here again uh, in, uh, in Providence. Many years ago, I lived uh, right up the road, so that my first time at, uh, at Brown was way back in the 20th century when I was um, a student at uh, Brandeis, right up the road. Over the years, I've been here two or three times since that time, and so it's always, it's always a pleasure to come. Presented in 1897 as an address before the American Negro Academy, which Du Bois alongside Alexander Crummel founded, Du Bois's conservation of races comes down to us today largely stripped of the defining context of this discourse. One in a series of research papers launched by a cadre of leading black creative intellectuals of the period, the conservation originally occasional papers number two, might be read as a statement or as the statement of the organization's reason for being. And as such, it stands in programmatic relationship to the protocol of the academy. Next to the souls of black folk, the conservation is one of Du Bois's most well-known writings although its inaugural conceptual gestures concerning natural law and race have long been superseded by the sciences of genetics and human evolution and advances across the spectrum of the human sciences. But to the extent that race matters are not exhausted by the sciences of man or the measure of man, but rather intrude their signature deep inside the lineaments of culture and society, Du Bois's emphasis is not inappropriate or ill-considered in the environment of 1897. We're talking about post-reconstruction and the veritable reign of terror bearing down on the everyday life of freedmen's communities little more than a generation removed from emancipation, and perhaps nowhere more dramatically and powerfully signed than in the ruins wrought by Plessy v. Ferguson and its separate but equal social logic that will prevail as public policy and practice for the next half century. It is therefore hard to doubt that it is this dimension of race, race as cultural and social value, race as the most pressing thematic on the American agenda in the approach to a new century that decides the over-determined conclusions that Du Bois draws when he argues, for instance, that, quote, the history of the world is the history not of individuals, but of groups, not of nations, but of races. Du Bois goes on to suggest that differences between these groups are not determined by physical distinctions alone, or even foremost, but by the cohesiveness and continuity of these groups, what Du Bois calls spiritual, psychical differences. Now, it is not clear to me why Du Bois seeks scientific sanction in order to evoke race here when it is evident that historical circumstances have ordained such reference with seasonal consistency. Moreover, he needs race or group in order to secure the notion of 
the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life, is the way Du Bois puts it. And these ideals of life seem to conduce to race organization, race solidarity, race unity, in the interest of that realization of a broader humanity that freely recognizes differences in men, but sternly deprecates inequality in their opportunities of development. Du Bois apparently believed that each race offers some distinct gift of spirit to humankind, and that the Negro, Du Bois's word for it, in amalgamating American culture by birth and citizenship, by political ideals, language, and religion, and membership in a, quote, vast historic race from the very dawn of creation, this amalgamation is the first fruit of a new nation, quote, the harbinger of that black tomorrow which is yet destined to soften the whiteness of the Teutonic today. Du Bois' appeal to race organization, and by that he enters the following catalog, Negro colleges, Negro newspapers, Negro business organizations, a Negro school of literature and art, and an intellectual clearinghouse for all these products of the Negro mind, which we may call a Negro academy, is therefore predicated on the need of the black community to effect a, quote, positive advance and ascertain an imperative for negative defense. But such an advance, Du Bois thought, will fructify only if eight million souls who constitute Du Bois' larger target audience are honest, fearlessly criticizing their own faults, zealously correcting them. To evolve, therefore, by careful conference and thoughtful interchange of opinion, the broad lines of policy and action for the American Negro Du Bois sketches the principal features of a broadly ambitious critical inquiry. In order to become a successful academy or a successful calling or vocation, the academy would be one, representative in character, two, impartial in conduct, and three, firm in leadership. The address ends with an evocation of seven principles that make up what Du Bois called the Academy Creed. And I will select only one of them to elaborate. Quote, we believe that the first and greatest step toward the settlement of the present friction between the races, commonly called the Negro problem, lies in the correction of the immorality, crime, and laziness among the Negroes themselves which still remains as a heritage from slavery. We believe that only earnest and long-continued efforts on our part can cure these social ills. By today's logic of public relations, number five could be read as the airing of dirty laundry, as we recognize in it the future rumblings of discontent that will break across the landscape whenever what we might call intramural critique is raised from any quarter of observation concerning the conduct of African American life and thought. Most recently, Bill Cosby's remarks at an annual NAACP convocation a few years ago, and even President Obama's address still more recently to the organization on the occasion of its centennial birthday, both belong to a tradition of rhetoric as well as a configuration of ideas that is rejected often enough by black leaders and the rank and file 
and is at least as old as the early 19th century if we consider certain Samanic discourse in the annals of the African-American pulpit. Such patterns of address therefore do not begin with Du Bois and clearly do not end with him. I have heard at least one historian decry whole texts by Du Bois, the Philadelphia Negro, for instance, because Du Bois was said to have been castigating the victim. One wants neither to praise nor condemn acts of intramural or intraracial criticism, though there are reasons why one would definitely encourage such a thing, but rather to try to sketch out the reasons why hostility to these modes of response is a riddle that it is past time to solve, but furthermore, to make use of. Just as Du Bois's conservation of races and the project that it addressed were drafted in an era when the target NATO community was entirely consonant with a demographic focus and configuration that matched precise coordinates on an urban landscape, the fear and resentment of critique assume an isolation of vulnerable social subjects which is no longer the case if it is defined according to a racialized perception of reality. In other words, vulnerability in the social order is no longer determined by race alone, but cuts right across the racial fault lines into the heart of a class analysis that is so clear and stark today that we actually look right past it. But it must be acknowledged that the loudness of partisans who appear aligned according to racialized content is in the nature of the case so overwhelming and that defines an aspect or the overwhelmingness of the loudness defines an aspect of its features of intimidation that only a racial response in kind seems right. What we have witnessed on the streets of the country since August this year, for example, the hideous effigies of the president and the outright threats that have been made against his person and the entire panoply of assault on his legitimacy as president from the simian blob having just been executed by two policemen who interestingly enough look like bandits, which drawing makes the political cartoon another genre of messages altogether, to the fantastical insistence that President Obama is not really an American, but the son of a Kenyan father and mother attracted to men of the third world, all of which render him not only a stranger, but a veritable monster of strangeness. This entire spectacle of hateful, murderous resentment is race-based, and we would be foolish, I think, to call it by any other name as in attributing such responses to his policies. Make no mistake, there is a good deal to say about the new administration's policy choices. Perhaps we could say more accurately, its failure to choreograph policy is a worrisome characteristic of these new actors. Their tendency to pursue the politically expedient course is an early warning sign that the joyful eschatological rift that inflected the 2008 election season has been suddenly converted into a kind of turbulence that we've not seen before and whose end is not now predictable. But the other real danger would be to assume that these outbursts of malice that pull no punches about the partisans' desire to bring down the federal government are self-generated and self-sustaining. They may well be, as attested by their vehemence, but not alone are they mobilized against 
what seems the common good. To think so would be an error of judgment. The media spectacles, for all their dangerous power, are also induced and encouraged, I believe, by forces well concealed along the back trails of the headline news, to wit, the unbridled capitalist engines of speculation and greed that have not been reined in and given their free ride over the ravaged body of labor since the Reagan years may now be beyond reach. Joined with the systematic propaganda of hard right-wing organizations, the unprecedented assault on legitimate democratic procedure now defines the current historic juncture which must be answered whether we choose to do so now or later. I would submit that there is not much later left. This is not the first time that I have sensed that natal community is confronted with the possibility, perhaps even the necessity, of expanding its vocation to embrace more of the surround. To take up, in fact, the posture of a critical stance that I believe Du Bois encouraged when very early in his career he held out an ambition for black culture to become a kind of oasis in a, quote, dusty desert of dollars and smartness. By the 1950s, Du Bois was disappointed that the culture had not then made the transition to itself as a site alternative to material interests, but was as captivated or seduced by the appeals of appetite and consumption as any other American community. This wideness of critical purpose meant for Du Bois's time, and I'm not sure that the calling or vocation is very different today, that the subject take up the propositions of kinship and belonging in ways that are not fixed and static, but that engage with what Kierkegaard called the subjectivity of freedom, and which Ellison's protagonist enacts as ways of being situated in the world. In other words, blackness is not isolated from the larger human and planetary vocation toward which the project of humanitas is turned, though it is not clear that we have the, the wherewithal to speak clearly in such terms today. Autocritique, in its wider communal function and address, returns to double consciousness, but as if and as for the first time. I call it or think of it as the second birth. In the first instance, one is born into natal community, a biological event. But in the mark and knowledge of the advent of double consciousness, which may also be experienced as a trauma, one is born again into the self-reflexive critical capacity. And it came to me after thinking about um, double consciousness for a very long time and reading a number of quite brilliant uh, people discussing double consciousness. It came to me all of a sudden that double consciousness is not a subject that's just about blackness that it is a human subject, and that all subjects, perhaps, if they're lucky, even though it might not feel that it's luck that's happening at that time, that all subjects over undergo this second birth. And I had it in a very strange place. Uh, I had it at a very strange site that uh, might be reject-worthy on the face of it. I mean, if I told you that uh, that it came to me from William Faulkner <laughs> that, 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 that double consciousness could have more than a single reference. It came to me teaching 
um, for the umpteenth time, uh, Absalom, Absalom. And what I discovered about uh, the self-fashioned subject who becomes uh, Sutpen in uh, that novel is that that is a character who has a second birth. And it's that second birth that sends him running for the rest of his life. So that it's, it, it's a birth over and beyond the place where we start. So it is this self-reflexive critical capacity that I think double consciousness is, is taking up. And if our leaders are not encouraging such a step and show no signs themselves of such self-refashioning or reinvention, then perhaps it is time for us to get some new leaders. Thank you. I too want to, uh, to thank uh, Tony. I think this is my uh, sixth trip to Brown in the past uh, two years. Uh, I guess I've been here so often I knew my way here from the airport and could direct the cabbie, which was always interesting. I want to thank uh, Jerry Augusto for always being a wonderfully generous hostess and uh, making me feel at home, no small feat, seeing I'm a person who is foreign to the concept of home. And I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to spend some time with me here on what is turning out to be a rather nice autumn evening. Uh, now, not too long ago, uh, my very good friend and colleague, Hortense Spillers, remarking on the performative excellence of jazz musicians like Thelonious Monk, Billie Holiday, and Leonardine Price observed, music in black culture achieved its superior degree of development in part because its ancestral forces were occasioned. The point is plain enough. Musicianship weighs fully in the balance, but this notwithstanding, the excellence of the music of reference is in the performance of, let us say, an intelligence occasioned by a myriad confluence of events, including the instruments of performance. Performance as well is a function of a certain attention to the confluence, an ear for the flow. This is a way of talking about how the musician as a model for the expression of an intelligence occasioned by the historical condition engaging the mind and is not talking about it as an expression of ego. Hortense's insight about music is made in the course of an analogy she draws between the work of musical performance of the black, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and that of black creative intelligence in order to understand what is the work of black creative intellectual for all we know now? By analogy, we are to understand that just as with music, the work of the black creative intellectual is performance, leading to the question, what then is the instrument of the black creative intellectual? And in accord with the theme of her musical analogy, Hortense answers sharply and flatly, it is the production process of the object. Of knowledge. This answer should give pause. It is extrapolated from a ponderance 1965 seminar given by Louis Althusser at the Ecole Nomère, entitled To Capital à la Philosophie de Marx, and known to us, of course, in the US through the title of its English language translation, From Capital to Marx's Philosophy, which appears as the first chapter in the volume, Reading Capital. It was a seminar that beckoned us to embrace an historicism predicated on the radical disidentification of knowledge and real history, such that the thought objects of knowledge could not be confused with any given real object. Once Althusser had drawn out the radical distinction between the production processes of a given real object and that of the object of thought, he could then reveal their true relationship as functions in an apparatus of thought, founded on and articulated to natural and social reality. In other words, as Hortense recalls for us, the point is that this system of conditions of theoretical practice then 
is what assigns any given thinking subject its place and function in the production of knowledge. And it is from this perch she can then state that the central positionality of the black creative intellectual is constituted by systematic theoretical practice and that this is her or his instrument forever and anon. The claim is bluntly stated. The only question that the intellectual can actually use is to what extent do the conditions of theoretical practice pass through him or her as the living site of a significant intervention. I wish this afternoon to seriously take up Hortense's invitation to contemplate the conditions of theoretical practice in this way. I do so to settle an old argument we've been having for quite some time, which is why I must beg your indulgence. It's an argument about the nature of the relationship between the Negro, the black, and humanism. This has really been an argument about language, about the full indexical force of naming words. Names do more than designate things. They indicate an orientation in life, not in some abstract sense, but in the sense of a grammar that emerges out of a set of human practices in life that work in the creation of the world. So we have argued over the designations Negro and Black and what they have to do with humanism. Don't be fooled. The onus is on humanism, or rather, it is on a certain history of knowledge that presumptively identifies itself with humanism, with the humanism, as if there were such a thing. In any event, I think I have found a way to Hortense's thinking, which, I, which is what I will share with you now. And while I concur wholeheartedly with the disregard for the persistent compulsion to reduce thinking to social mapping expressed in Hortense's analogy, it is the conditions of theoretical practice that warrant great care. Rather, I want to be careful not to too easily arrest thinking in thought. So I've parceled out my sharing into three parabolic mutun, three principal texts. I label them observations and place each under a rubric in whose engagement I perform a certain type of thinking, a sort of isnad, a sort of narrative genealogy of intelligence. And this is itself a practice of some merit, albeit regrettably underplayed. Observation one, the Negro problem. Jazz music objectifies America. This remark of Wynton Marcellus's is taken from the beginning of Ken Burns' controversial film, Essay Jazz. They are the film's very first verbally narrated words and are heard just as Paul Hofler's 1955 photograph of Louis Armstrong on stage in Rochester, New York, fills the screen, displacing the opening shot. There is something powerfully evocative about the Hofler photograph in its composition of contrasting elements, the very dark-skinned Satchmo, elegantly clad in an off-white double-breasted suit, is caught spotlighted in the soloist moment with his trumpet tipped to the heavens, set against the backdrop of his tuxedo-clad orchestra playing in the shadows. All of this documents a certain historical attitude and exhibits the full range of arguably its most expressive form. In fact, Hoffner's Armstrong photo has achieved widespread preeminence as a powerful archetypical image of the jazz performance. Its preeminence may have something to do with how the image so vividly evokes the knot of individual music, musical improvisation and collaborative, iterative performance, the principal aspect of which is a pronounced eminence that is called for by and calls on antecedent and anonymous blues forms, as well as popular tunes. Leaving aside for the moment the vexing issue of collective commonplace or standards, such an image exudes something of the spontaneous energy of the musical interaction jazz players appropriately call swing, a term different and more evocative than the more pedestrian musicological word improvisation. There is a sense that swing more adequately designates the historical nature of jazz as an American musical form. Part of this sense of adequacy has to do with the identification of jazz performance with what America is supposed to be as an historical force. The commercial element in the mix is intimated by the opening shot of the film, the shot that Hoffler's image of Armstrong displaces, which is a panoramic view of Times Square, New York City, circa 1926. In keeping with Burns's 
filmmaking style, the images are arranged in coincidence with a very broad and remarkably anachronistic musical arrangement, as well as a sundry of dramatically narrated literary texts from historical documentation to personal testimony and in-camera commentary. The music accompanying both the Times Square shot and Hofler's photo is a 1931 Armstrong performance of Stardust, taken from his album, Louis Armstrong, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Marcellus's remark is a voiceover, pitch so that it is just audible enough along with the music. Having stated that jazz objectifies America, he pauses for a full bar or so of Starbust, Starbust, Stardust, I'm sorry. <clears throat> then continues, it is an art form that can give us a peerless way of understanding ourselves. Hofler's Armstrong image still in view when he pauses again for another part of music, which is followed by a cutaway from Hofler, from the Hofler photo to a headshot of Marcellus, continuing his commentary as the music begins to slowly fade into background noise. The eminence so powerfully evoked by Hofler's portrait is transferred to Marcellus, and rather forcibly so, by Byrne's coincidental arrangement of music with photographic image and dramatic narrative testimony. A good deal of this sense of imminence has to do with Marcellus's own particular investment in a historicist account of jazz as a musical form, as the preeminent expression of a style or a way of life articulated in the immediacy of living in a social and political milieu of racial classification and violent discrimination. So what he says at that moment commands our full attention. The real power of jazz and the innovation of jazz is that a group of people can come together and create art, improvised art, and can negotiate their agendas with each other. And that negotiation is the art. Like you were there all the time when Bach improvised. And he did improvise, but he wasn't going to look at the second viola and say, OK, let's play Ein Fosterberg. They were not going to do that. Whereas in jazz, you, I can get together. I can go to Milwaukee tomorrow, and there'll be three musicians. I walk into a bar at 2.30 in the morning and say, what are you going to play, man? Let's play some blues. And all three, all four of us, are going to start playing. Everybody will start comp comping and playing and listening in the bass. You never know what they're going to do. So that's our art. The four of us can have a dialogue. We can have a conversation. We can speak to each other in the language of music. Burns' filmic composition is a reflection of Marcella's investment in historicism, a reflection to be sure so pale and diminished as to risk being grotesque. Yet some sense of the vital force of jazz still resonates with the conversation played out between narrative readings, images, and music, achieving some sort of documentary account of a certain historical attitude called American. And it is no small thing that the iconic image of this attitude is a black man originally from the city of New Orleans playing a trumpet. The fundamental character of this image is emphasized a little later in the first chapter of Burns' film entitled Gumbo, when Marcellus is explaining how the musical origins of jazz are found in the mingling of various immigrant and autochthonous cultural forms in New Orleans during the first half of the 19th century. It is a romantic city, he says, talking about New Orleans' cultural profile as the most cosmopolitan city in antebellum America, with its famous French opera house and its two full symphony orchestras. This cultural aspect of the city was not restricted to the bourgeoisie. The vendors in the street would sing arias, Marcellus tells us. And he goes on to say, people are very integrated in the way they lived. One block, you have an Italian family, various types of Negroes. You have some Creole. You have Germans. You know, you have everybody all mingled. They can't escape each other. Describing the New Orleans social milieu as being driven by dynamic ethnic integration, Marcellus aims to establish an indissoluble link between this dynamic and that of jazz as a musical form. There is something remarkable about the way this linkage is made, however. The reference to the three of the four elements composing the social milieu, the Italians, Germans, and Creole, suggests some sort of integral collective consciousness based on national language. Yet Marcellus introduces a distinction when, refer when referring to the fourth element, various types of Negroes. It is not at all clear what the nature or categories of variety are. They may very well include dimensions of national language. But it is abundantly clear that they are predicated on a constant, Negro, the social force of which is equivalent to that of national language-based ethnic identity. Jazz emerges with the Negro, a point Marcellus emphasizes by explaining how the imposition of Jim Crow in New Orleans at the end of the century forced the Francophone Creole 
who for the better part of the century had been as a class prominent purveyors of high European musical forms to become Negroes, thereby adding a technical precision to the rhythmic complexity and verve of the already existing variegated Negro music coming from Congo Square. Negro. Marcellus's consistent use of the term throughout Burns' film is not merely an anachronistic designation of those we now tend to call African American. Something else is intended other than the facile raciological or ethnographic tag, something dynamic and in a profoundly materialist sense, something historical. As is evident in his repeatedly associating the term with a distinctive set of life practices that articulate a certain style and way of thinking with music being one of the definitive modes by which that way of thinking in life is actual. He emphasizes this association, albeit in a casual, non-didactic manner, to the point it becomes very clear that for him, the term designates this way of thinking in life. It is in this way, of course, that he can continually talk about a style of intelligence associated with the Negro in jazz as emblematic of America, as indexing a complex of historical forces and social transformations. Marcellus breaks no new ground here in complaining the Negro as designating what Alain Locke, under the banner of the New Negro movement, commonly associated with the Harlem Renaissance and called the emergence of a new psychology. In its most radical aspect, the orientation of Locke's project was towards the peculiar modes of cultural creation of poesis articulated in the Negro's daily life practices as an archetypical humanist way of life that offered up a profoundly inclusive theory of freedom. Marcellus's understanding the performative styles of jazz to express a peculiar kind of intelligence keeps to this orientation, just as it also resonates intensely with the ideas elaborated by the novelists and critics Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison, as well as those of Stanley Edgar Hyman and Kenneth Burke, all of whom engage the event of music associated with the Negro, principally the blues, but also jazz, as occasion for contemplating the general problematic of the relation between creative intelligence and the world not as a question of subjective will or ego, but as the convergence of traceable historical events. The point is that Marcellus's use of Negro is a commemoration. It calls to remembrance and so puts back into play this way of theorizing the Negro as the emblem of positive human creative imagination. Observation two, theorizing the Negro problem. The human mind and absolute and provable truth approach each other and like the asymptotes of the hyperbola would approach each other nearer and nearer and yet never in all eternity meet. This comes from a letter W.E.B. Du Bois wrote to Herbert Aptheker in January 1956, prompted by his reading Aptheker's History and Reality, which he took to be a wonderfully insightful understanding of the problematic informing his own project concerning the relationship between the Negro question and the human condition. Thematically, the letter returns to postulates Du Bois made in his earlier essays like My Evolving Program for Negro Freedom, The Study of the Negro Problem, and Sociology Hesitant. In it, Du Bois once again lays out the methodological bases for his sociology of the Negro problem. I turned, therefore, he writes, to assumption, to scientific hypotheses. I assumed the existence of truth, since to assume anything else or not to assume was unthinkable. I assumed that truth was only partially known, but that it was ultimately largely knowable, although perhaps in part forever unknowable. Science adopted the hypothesis of a knower and something known. Jamesian pragmatism, as I understood it from his lips, was not based on the usefulness of a hypothesis, but on its workable logic if its truth was assumed. Also of necessity, I assumed cause and change. With these admittedly unprovable assumptions, I propose to make a scientific study of human action based on the hypothesis of the reality of such actions, of the causal connections and of their continued occurrence and change because of law and chance. I called sociology the measurement of the elements of chance in human action. This is all familiar stuff. What is achieved, though? by asserting, on the one hand, that possibility in knowledge, epistemic possibility to speak technically, is ultimately 
conventional, and so never absolutely true. And on the other, that what is absolutely true can be known. In one sense, the boy seems to be stating that we can have as clear an idea of truth as we have, say, of a triangle. But we cannot have as clear a mental image of truth as of a triangle. That is, we cannot imagine truth, but we can indeed conceive it. Keeping to this fair paraphrase, however, this does not mean that we have no image of truth at all. Rather, any such image is in asymptotic relation to the concept. To turn it around, the concept is a singularity that is imagined along certain tangential lines of possibility, pointing towards but never reaching it. It is in the deictic object, which is the object of mimesis, properly speaking, that the concept is exhibited as such. So axiomatic knowledge, or law, is a poetic representation of reality that displays certain ways of thinking about reality as open-ended practices. The value of knowledge does not stem from what it knows, but rather from the activity of knowing, from how it knows. This brings us to the heart of the matter. What begins as an account of possibility and knowledge turns out to be about conventional practice. We know from his numerous public statements on the matter that Du Bois insisted on the designation Negro. One of the better known of these statements is his 1928 correspondence with the young Roland Barton of South Bend, Indiana, published in the NAACP journal Crises under the title, The Name Negro. In response to Barton's objecting to Crises persistently using the word because it is a white man's word to make us feel inferior, the boys who at the time was actively engaged in lobbying the New York Times for the capitalization of the term states that names are not merely matters of thought and reason, they are growths and habits. Of particular significance to the point being made here is his comment further on in the same letter that Negro is not historically accurate. No name ever was historically accurate. Neither English, French, German, white, Jew. They were all at first nicknames, misnomers, accidents, grown eventually to conventional habits in achieving accuracy because and simply because wide and continued usage rendered them accurate. In this sense, Du Bois concludes, Negro is quite as accurate, quite as old, and quite as definite as any name of any great group of people. If the word Negro gives way to the simple American, as Barton advocated, then Du Bois asks, what word shall we use when we want to talk about those descendants of dark slaves who are largely excluded still from full American citizenship? and from complete social privilege with white folk. His interrogative immediately gives way to a postulate. Here is something that we want to talk about, that we do talk about, that we Negroes could not live without talking about. And then, too, without the word that means us, where are those spiritual ideals, those inner bonds, those group ideals, and forward strivings of this mighty army of 12 million? The very fact that Negro exhibits the indissoluble identification of its nature with its genesis, it is a white man's word, makes it a singular emblem, emblem, not just of the formations of political economy in the New World, but also of the particular historical practices of creative, decidedly liberatory knowledges, whose conceptual speculations and reflections, its theories, are irreducibly coincidental with those formations. Some years earlier in his 1890 Harvard commencement address, Du Bois described such practices and knowledges as the non-egotistical manifestation of intelligence and agencies in humans. This notion that Negro designates the way of life practice at the intercies of capital is at the heart of his work. And indeed, Du Bois' attention was on the way the existence of any given particular population as a collective actor in history, and supposedly therefore an agent of change, is a function of known and discernible configurations and transformations of power. One might well add that these configurations and transformations of power are exclusively in the mode of human institutions that delineate ranges of possible activity, usually thought, usually through directing our desires, by capturing or managing our imagination, and so spawning certain types, certain ways, of living a life. 
The claim being made in the Harvard speech was that while America is indeed a certain form of energy, the object of which is economy of force, Negro designates the ways of life practiced at the intercease of that economy, as well as the ways of thinking spawned by those practices and modes of knowing they in turn institute. Thinking the Negro to designate the concrete material ways, transformations of power, of disciplining force applied to life, articulate certain possible practices of life was a primary focus of Du Bois's lifelong engagement with the Negro. Recognizing that it is the set of practices of life available to a given population that constitute a mutually recognizable collectivity, a people, and that these practices are themselves constituted in the intricacies of the configuration of power, entails understanding that profound transformational changes in those configurations unavoidably unavoidably involve the overlapping extinction and genesis of actual populations. And so, in the story of the coming of John, John Jones could tell the combined Methodist and Presbyterian congregations of black El Tamaha gathered together in the Baptist church at the beginning of the 20th century, when the emerging structures of international capital were already reaching even quaint little hamlets like theirs, subtly ushering significant transformations of lives, he could tell them that the age demanded new ideas and that they were far different from those men of the 17th and 18th centuries with broader ideas of human brotherhood and destiny. The question was, he says, what part the Negro would have in the new century? Functioning in an American economy of force that Du Bois describes in Dusk of Dawn as an evil and hindrance blocking the way of life whose current raciological form depended on the long history of relations and contact between thought and idea. The challenge was to determine what, if anything, of the human endures this process of creative destruction. The Negro is historically, as well as by definition, an object of American force. It is brought about by a profound transformation in the configuration of capital from the European-centered national market system of imperial imperialist colonialism into the US-centered anti-imperialist international financial system that emerged during the period framed by the end of Reconstruction in 1877 and the Treaty of Versailles in 1918. The significance of this proposition is not just that Du Bois recognized the Negro to be emblematic of the human condition under international capital, although in so doing he radically broke with the then dominant understanding of the Negro as an external pre-capitalist social form. What is most important about his theory is the postulate that the Negro is also emblematic of the ways in which humanist practices of life and forms of knowledge still inhere within this brutal economy of force. We have that, a theory of the Negro, according to which the enduring practices of black folk are answers to questions posed by the situation of power and domination in which they arose. They are strategic and stylized answers that set up the situation, drawing attention to its structure and essential elements. These strategies themselves entail a pattern whose constant attitude towards the situation is best characterized as a continuous stylized practice. This Negro designates a set of practices and ways of knowing that are articulated with power, but not of power, whose constitutional function is to maintain a way of human thinking that is coincidental and adequate to a completely terrestrial, inhuman concentration of violent force. Here Du Bois anticipates Antonio Gramsci, who was also able to see the Negro problem as emblematic of the force of American power. Observation three, la questione de negre. One might look into the indirect influence that these American Negro intellectuals could exercise on the backward masses in Africa, and even the direct influence they could exercise if American expansionism used American Negroes as agents to take hold of African markets and to extend American civilization. <clears throat> this observation comes from the well-known note 49, notebook four, of Gramsci's prison notebooks, which bears the heading, Gli intellectuali, intellectual. Well, it really doesn't come from there. Rather, it comes from Notebook 12, where 49 is repeated in its entirety 
but with very slight modifications concerning the Negro question. This is rather significant because Notebook 12 is the first of Gramsci's notebooks to be organized in a thematically coherent way, and it is clear by how it carries forward straight forward or straight away the themes of Notebook 4 without any organizational changes, that the exposition of the intellectuals question in the earlier notebook was a fully thought through and careful presentation. Now, there are two obvious points to be made here. The first is that Gramsci's thinking is about the nature of intelligence and human agency in change and in terms of the history of thought. And that that way of thinking about it is a function of the history of class formation in the European context. But he approaches America as a complex of historical events that are unexplainable according to the history of thought. The second point is when Gramsci does attempt to approach America, it is in terms of the, it is in terms of the Negro. He does so through the Negro. The Negro is the limit concept of America in two respects. In the first, it is the limit concept with respect to the perception of America as a new civilization. As a category of historical analyses, the Negro poses a challenge to that concept by functioning as a verifiable instance of the historical processes by which humans are civilized. The Negro is made in America, is the decisive expression of the historical social situation of America. What the Negro expresses, then, is the very complex of historical events that are unexplicable by historicism. The Negro differs from America as a limit concept in another respect, however, as the concept of America's task, which is to elaborate a new type of man suited to the new type of work and productive processes of capitalism. This task can be construed as the history of the perceptual and intellectual functional unity of America in the world. Gramsci approaches that history, again, through the Negro. This is abundantly clear in the first of the modifications he makes to the note, which is the text of observation. It is the addition of the phrase, American civilization, civiltà americani. And this addition indexes the first reference to Americanism in the prison notebook, which occurs in notebook three, note 11, also written in 1930. And this note is a critical engagement with some remarks by Perendello in an interview conducted by Carado Alvaro, which appeared in Italia Letteraria in April 1929. And what Perendalo imagines is that America is colonizing the world through cheap culture and finance, and that this is a new barbaric civilization. Gramsci understands this to be an error, and indeed he asserts that what Perandello imagines as a new and somewhat barbaric order emerging out of the new world to conquer Europe is more rightly recognized as symptomatic of a transformation in social history and not the establishment of a new order, of a new civilization. In fact, Americanism is not new at all because it does not change the character of the fundamental classes. It is about the extension and intensification de la civiltà europea of European civilization which, however, has assumed certain peculiarities in the American climate. What does Gramsci mean, then, when subsequently in Notebook 12, he explicitly identifies American market expansion in Africa with Civiltà Americani? How does he account for the apparent contradiction? And why does it occur around the figure of the Negro? The key is in understanding precisely what is meant by the term Civiltà. There are two distinct, perhaps even contradictory, senses at play in Gramsci's reading of Americanism. In the first sense, the one he cites from Pirandello, it is something like the condition of a people having achieved a certain degree of technological and spiritual progress through the totality of the humanistic control over the political, industrial, and social spheres of activity. This sense, prevalent among Italian intellectuals at the time, echoes the conservative notions expressed by Matthew Arnold and John Ruskin, for whom industrialization carried the threat of destroying civilization. It is in this sense that civiltà might be understood to mean the customs of civil life characterized by the genteel and urbane persona of elevated sentiment, achieved through an elevated cultural education, which may be why Hor and Smith, as well as Buttigieg, were inclined to translate it as civilization, carrying the 19th century European sense of culture as the instrument with which civilized man is formed. If the problem is formulated in this way, Gramsci states then, in America, there is no more than the remasticating of the old European culture. 
But as he also states, this is not the problem. The problem is whether a transformation of the material basis of, 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 of Civita is taking place. The focus on transformations in material basis suggests that Civita, in the sense of the relationship between changes in the modalities of material production, of technology, of industrialism in this instance, and social institutions and the expression of intelligence, both institutional and in particular, is what's at stake, is what is fostered in the relationship. Now, a good deal of work of, the note, of note 49 is to elaborate the history of this relationship with the exposition of how the history of class formation informed contemporary intellectual practices in Europe, so that European intellectuals across the full spectrum, from conservative to liberal, and radical responses to industrialism, were incapable of thinking beyond the ideological horizons of their common class. That is, they could not think transformation in material modalities except in terms of a struggle over continuity or rupture, which is why America presented such a, a conundrum. They could only think the intellectual expression of transformation in terms of culture. Their sense of Americanism, then, is symptomatic of a failure to engage the difficult question of the historical relationship between materiality and, intention, and intelligence. For Gramsci, the complexity that fell under the designation America was significant because of how it foregrounded this question as an event of transformation in Civita that, that may yield indeed a rupture, but is not yet the expression of that rupture. In fact, he insists that understanding what Americanism is requires recognizing it as an aspect of a transformation in European civilization, a point he explicitly makes in Notebook 22, Note 2, Rationalization of the Demographic Composition of Europe, where he observes, America does not have great historical and cultural traditions, but neither does it have to support the leaden burden of, the, the leaden burden of classes that are purely parasitic <clears throat> that characterizes European civilization. America's lacking the history of class formation explains Gramsci's assertion in Notebook 4 and 12 that there is a complete absence of traditional intellectuals in America. The absence is not a function of, of an historical rupture, of an epiphenomenal American exceptionism. Rather, it is a function of events in the realignment of European class formation that are coincidental with the material transformations associated with the emergence of mercantilism, exploration, the nation state, and early capital accumulation. To the extent that we are to understand Civilta as the history of that process and its institutions, America is a transformation in Civilta that may be symptomatic of its end, but not the heterogeneous cause of it. The transformation is in the reduction of all intellectual energy to the solving of practical problems. As Gramsci remarks, because the tendency in America is for all human forces, tutte forse umani, to concentrate on structural work, and one cannot yet talk of superstructures, the only kind of poesia, the only kind of poesis, that is creation, is the economical practical. Americanism does not equal a new civilta, but rather a transformation in the procedures of civilta as governance. Although the notion of civilta as a form of civil govern of government is archaic, it has some bearing on Gramsci's account of the dynamic of thinking articulated in the relationship between modalities of materialization, social institutions, and intelligence. So much so that it is arguably best translated as civility in contradiction to the current dominant Anglophone preference for civilization which has consequences along with how we think about civil society. In any event, as civility, what is underscored is how Gramsci's use of Gilita Americani entails his recognition that the object of American power is the subjugation of life itself to governable labor. What Gramsci finds in Americanism, then, is a rationalism that has determined the need to elaborate a new type of man. He postulates that the preponderance of this rationalist tendency in America stems from the absence of class formation found in Europe, which leads to a paradox in his analysis, because that absence has hindered, in his words, adequate formulation of the fundamental question of hegemony. He further notes that there are three impediments to that formulation. These are the absence of a national homogeneity, the mixture of race cultures, and the Negro question. The paradox is exacerbated by his referring to the Negro as the agent for extending American civility to a supposedly pre-national Africa through market expansion. This goes to the heart of the, of the matter. The nature of the relationship Gramsci presumes between the Negro and civility. That is, 
how the supposed backwardness of the masses of Africa is contrasted to the American Negro intellectual. This brings us to the second significant modification of the intellectual's note, and I'll wrap up with that. As it appears in Notebook 12, which has to do with the language question. This does not appear in our text, but in the, in the modified version of the note, the first of the two questions of language key to the expansion of American civility to Africa reads, since the language of American Negroes is English, whether it could become the educated language of Africa bringing unity in the place of the existing myriad of dialects is of important concern. The second question is then revised accordingly to suggest that this intellectual stratum could have sufficient assimilating and organizing capacity to give a national character to the present primitive sentiment of being a despised race, raising the African continent to the mythic function of common fatherland of all Negroes. Now particularly noteworthy is how this modification elaborates and emphasizes the interrelationship between, between language and civility. Language is interrelated to the potential for the expression of a constituting mythology of nation. Given Gramsci's reflections throughout the notebooks on the necessity of a national language literature for national formation, this is not at all surprising. What's more, in keeping with his recognition of the centrality of the economical practical in America, it is logical that in the instance of the American Negro, this formation should be a function of market expansion. This, however, this is, however, a portion of the note that occurs, there is, however, rather, a portion of the note that occurs in Notebook 12, exactly as it did in Notebook 4, without modification. And that is Gramsci's remark about American Negroes having more of a negative than a positive national and racial spirit, a spirit, in other words, born out of the struggle waged by the whites in order to isolate and dishearten them. It is not far-fetched to read this passage as indicating Gramsci's understanding the Negro's orientation towards Civilta along lines quite similar to that of Du Bois. In other words, to the extent that Civilta is understood as the history of the process of material transformations associated with the emergence of capital, that is, as civilization, Negro consciousness is a negative function of that history. And to the extent that Civilta is understood as the intelligence of that system unfolding in law, that is, as civility, the same consciousness is a reactionary response rather than a positive articulation of law. It is an articulation from law, but not of law. Fully aware that the Negro per se is a figure of positive law, Gramsci discerns in that very intelligence a force that while indexed by the legal category Negro, exceeds the law's capacity of categorization. The implication is that the Negro is energy, converted to capital through absolute coercive force, a conversion that makes irrelevant the old, still humanistic problem of how to definitively define the difference between authentic and inauthentic life. The question at this point, then, which is why I will leave you, is to what extent do the conditions of theoretical practice and the concrete social reality articulate the Negro intellectual as the living site of a significant intervention? Hortense's question. The boys approaches this question in terms of work. Negro intellectuals work through the predicament of the infinitude of the social field by imposing on it the limit they experience. How does it feel to be a problem? Projected as a postulate, the Negro is emblematic of change. Theoretical practice persists as an oppositional and parasitic force to the capitalist mode of production. This definition is not without problems, some of which are potentially fatal. Chief among the latter is the problem of how to account for actual practices of life without appealing to a story of melancholy and redemption that necessarily postulates an overarching transcendent and from the perspective of powerlessness, necessarily benevolent agency. There is a real danger of slipping under the designation Negro an unarticulated argument for the prophetic. I close then finally by recalling the occasion for Hortense's inviting us to contemplate the possibilities of something like black creative intelligence. That occasion was the silver anniversary in 1994 of Cruz's crisis of the Negro intellectual. The driving impulse of her writing her piece is to attempt to figure out whether or not what Cruz did with the Negro then can be tried today with the black. Can we say more clearly now, after his example, Hortense ponders and qualifies, perhaps because of it, what the problem is that constitutes a crisis for the African-American creative intellectual at the moment. 
Her qualification, perhaps because of, must be taken very seriously in addressing the question of a peace. Having posed this question, she goes to great length to carefully elaborate the condition of Cruz's production, recalling the social turbulence of the 1960s and the clear-headed dogmatic certainty with which Cruz outlined the task he saw before him when he, when he announced that the special function of the Negro intellectual is a cultural one. He should take the rostrum and assail the stiltifying blight of the commercially deprived white middle class who has poisoned the structural roots of the American ethos and transformed the American people into a nation of intellectual dotes. There is a pronounced respect here for the seeming resilience of Cruz's certainties, of his keen sense of the social function of the Negro intellectual that bears no trace of nostalgia. The language games of knowledge production have changed too radically in, a, in our society for anything like a Harold Cruz to really appear. In asking whether Cruz is conceivable today, Hortense is challenging us to recognize in the problem of creative black intellect, the general problematic of the history of thought. We are presented here with a way of thinking about the history of knowledge that does not require anything like Hegel's constitutive subject. It is a history of thought as the production of knowledge, as a performance, a performance that sustains human possibilities. However, in Kohate, rather than being predicated on the history of consciousness. According to my reading of Du Bois offered you this, this evening, the most adequate designation must itself be a function of that performance, which is enabled by certain sets of life practices. To keep a hard historicist eye on the matter, we could designate the practices Negro or Black and still be meaningful in both instances, although not all Negroes are Black. As Baldwin reminded us when he recalled the event at the Paris Conference in 56. So I suppose we would have to intend by that term a radical humanist posture or performance, something along the lines of its usage in Great Britain during the 1970s. But if we call it African, we are designating something else altogether, perhaps just one aspect of a thing. 